following so, process. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining our, yes. our presentation. So, uh, we have here so amazing panelists are here. They're going to share about their amazing story right now. So, um, first of all, my name is Kesiki. I'm the moderator from South Korea. So, we're going to first start my main story. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to kind of stand. Okay. We'll see how this works. I don't want to move this too much, but I might tilt it towards me so I don't have to have my back to everyone. So, aloha, everyone. I'm Nellie James. Aloha. Um, so, I'm the co founder of Mana Up. Uh, we are an accelerator and venture fund that works with local product entrepreneurs here in the islands. So, uh, we are an economic development initiative. Um, I'm a big believer um, in, of course, mentoring, networking, and I'm here for that, obviously. Uh, but also the concept of accelerating a business and what that means to do that. Um, so my co-founder, Brittany Hyde, and I started Mana Out uh, in 20... Well, Pio was around from the very beginning. So really 2017, all the ideas were percolating. But by 2018, we launched our first cohort. Um, and since then, um, we have had seven cohorts of companies, 74 companies, um, representing over 65 million in revenue to the state of Hawaii and over 400 jobs. Um, but through that process, really looking at what does it take to help companies who are growing in a place like Hawaii, um, who have great, who are helping to elevate the culture and the brand of Hawaii, but do have those challenges, and what does it take as an entrepreneur um, to grow uh, and to accelerate? So, you know, as we started Mana Up, um, we really looked at what were like key components <coughs> to our program, and I think it's a big, um, I, it's a big step for a lot of entrepreneurs to actually find an accelerator, some kind of program that starts to look at the gaps that you have in your own skill set. Um, I know for myself, starting my, uh, I have major gaps in my skill sets, and I'm very happy that my co-founder, Brittany, has filled in some of those gaps. Um, so I think it's also important to think about co-founders and why, um, how you decide to select them, um, and thinking about complementary skill sets. But for us, when she and I got together to start Mana Up, uh, we looked at, okay, what's happening in the marketplace what are entrepreneurs needing and what are those skills-based versus leadership versus one-on-one -on -one versus network uh, that really needs to be intertwined to make an impact and move the needle forward um, for their revenue. So, um, so yes, okay, got it. So, um, I'll just, you know what, I'm just going to use my All right, so, uh, so one of the pieces of our program is on skills-based learning. So for us, we focus on consumer packaged goods companies. So as people apply to Mana Up, we have no one get about 130 applications. So we're very specific on what our program is about and what you're going to get out of it. Uh, so one piece is skills-based. One area um, is around the workshops that we host that are really honing in on what entrepreneurs need in the product space. So as people, as people apply, they, we are very clear on what are the skills you're going to learn. A big one of those is e-commerce, um, and e-commerce training, fulfillment, marketing, all those good things, and storytelling, um, and helping solve those challenges. So I think from a skill standpoint, it's really important to understand what skills you're missing, what do you need to move the needle, right? Or do you have presence online? Um, do you understand your financials? Are your, is your packaging not so good? Um, are you having a tough time telling your why in your story? How do you inspire people to buy your products? So these are all really specific on the workshops and skills base that we have in the accelerator. The second piece is around leadership. Um, us as entrepreneurs, many of you folks are in the room, whether you think you might want to be an entrepreneur, you already are one, or you want to have that entrepreneurial spirit, I think it's really important one, to have that entrepreneurial spirit. But two, really thinking about from a leadership standpoint, we all have different things we've come to the table with. And suddenly you start a company, and now you're a CEO. And now you're supposed to be like having all of a sudden all these um, leadership qualities that maybe you didn't need prior to that. And so uh, another part of our program is around bringing in different leaders um, in the community, different CEOs that can add perspective, uh, because that is really tough to just learn on your own. Um, so that, I think, is a really important aspect of our, of our accelerator. 
The other piece that you get as you gain through a program is around skills, around uh, peer-based learning and peer-based connectivity. So I think as for all of you folks, can you raise your hand if you've been part of a program in the past with others, similar like a fellows program or an accelerator? Mahina, thank you so much for that. All right. So um, what's neat about it is having people that are alongside you that are having similar challenges. And for our entrepreneurs, a lot of times we'll start off the day just saying, hey, what's one thing you're really good at that you would love to help somebody with? And it's amazing to see that somebody's maybe really good at um, social media, or they may be really good at financials, um, and people are actually able to help each other. Because a lot of times, not that I don't believe in mentorship, but it's very important, but sometimes a mentor comes in and maybe you really went and had some really amazing accolades like 50 years ago. It's not as relevant now, but I'm, not, I'm, gonna be, I'm being very general here. But a lot of times it's going to be your peer that just went through um, that challenge. They just opened that store, a pop up, and all in one, and they know the rates and make sure you consider Cam with like you know all of the things. And so I think that's really important as we think about um, that peer based learning. So. Um, okay, so one of the things, uh, a couple of things I want you folks to think about as I'm going through this are four questions. Um, and I know we're talking about mentorship, skills based, but I'll have these four questions that I would like to have there, but I'll just read them. So, one, um, what's one thing you can do to grow? So, thinking about that. Two, what is one part of your life you want to take ownership of? Three, are there relationships you could be establishing? or stewarding better? And four, what is one risk you need to take that you have been holding back on? So I think these are the four components of having an entrepreneurial mindset. They're really important, not only from kind of taking on life, but also as you're thinking about maybe starting a business. So one, um, having a um, leadership or an ownership mentality, taking risks, you know, building your network, um, and also really thinking about having that learning mentality as well. So those are really four components uh, that I think are key aspects of having an entrepreneurial mindset. And those are kind of lended to the questions I just asked. So for you folks, I'll keep that in mind for today. Um, other pieces, just keep going down, it's okay. Um, in terms of, um, all right, best practices in providing mentorship so and also accelerating opportunities. So we're also really thinking about, everybody always wants to find a mentor, right? So it's like, one of the key questions here, especially with the description here, was how to build like um, your network, right? How to find men mentors. And people ask me all the time, well, how did you meet so many people and how did you create your mentors? Who are your mentors? And I always say, you know, you never want to show up to some event and say, Oh, excuse me, hi, I'm Melly. Can you be my mentor? <laughs> That's really not going to work. Um, so I, I, it's important to really look at, like, what do you bring to the table versus um, what is this person? How do you get to know them as a human? Um, and just starting to come to these types of events. I really applaud all of you for being here today. Um, of course, just being in the mix and meeting people, and it really a lot of it is very natural. But I always try to have certain um, things that might come up my sleeve, but in my back pocket. Um, having something like personal that you're willing to share. How do you, if there's a lull in the conversation, you always have a couple key nuggets um, that you can bring up. Maybe it was a trip you recently took. Or doing your homework with the people that are maybe in the room that you know. I think many of you folks got the list of all the speakers coming. You may not have gotten the full attendee list, but you got the speakers list. Do a little bit of research before. Maybe you know, they find out someone's like a Red Sox fan. I don't know, I'm coming up with random things. <laughs> but, uh, but having some of that, doing the work, and really, really figuring out and navigating who do you want to meet in the room, um, and taking advantage of that. But again, also, not coming in, dang, I only have one minute left? That's what happens on my slides. I've got to keep moving forward. All right. Uh, but really thinking about, one, um, having those key things in your back pocket, right, for conversation. It's really important to have that conversation. And also, um, as we look at areas with our accelerator, um, how are we helping to build those skill sets? So I see a couple of you in the room here that are in our accelerator. I see Lexi here. Um, I also see some Hula Lit in the room, even though he has not here. But, um, you know, that's also a big part of, of our program is how do we um, – create more opportunities for networking. I think that that's also really important. 
on. All right. I think it's also really important when you think about um, building your, your network when you actually push yourself to get outside of your norm. So, you know, I think everyone's got their normal friends to hang out with on the weekends or the evenings, you've got your mommy groups, whatever those are gonna be. Push yourself to get out of those general circles and really think about um, what you can be contributing. How do you pay it forward? It's not really about collecting all these people and what they can do for you. That comes naturally later. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why we were able to start <coughs> that so quickly. Um, was because Brittany and I are both big believers in paying it forward first. So thinking about how do you spread that, how do you, um, I always love meeting someone that has nothing to do with my world because it ends up just being really interesting and being naturally curious. But then later on, it ding dings in my head, one of my biggest skill sets I think is being a true connector and really thinking about where are the gaps. Oh, we should talk to this person I met three years ago at this random dinner party. Um, and how can that be helpful for someone like Lexi? So um, I'll stop there. And, um, Sorry, my slides are a little bit, but hopefully it was helpful. Sessions and then we have small incremental payments after that. 
And then we're also known for our free legal counseling. And we partner with the Business Law Corps, and they provide pro bono attorneys to come in and meet with our small businesses twice a month. So these are a couple of the programs that we provide. We provide the um, Launch My E-Commerce program, which is focused on starting up uh, your e-commerce business and building a Shopify website. Our Horizon Strategy for business, and business Growth and Resilience, that's the class that helps in setting up um, SOPs for your business. We have quarterly Ascent Roundtables, which are focused on the SBA platform called Ascent. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. It was uh, created probably about seven years ago, but it coincided right with the um, onset of COVID. So it's actually a free online platform specifically made for women um, small business owners. And it's not specifically a business plan platform, but you can create a business plan if you follow all of the courses. It's, it's all self-driven uh, and really, really provides a lot, of, um, a lot of tools that are all in one place to keep your business uh, growing and setting up those systems. Uh, we also do a nonprofit toolkit a couple times a year. A couple times a year. Uh, since most of our clients are women, they are really wanting to give back, and so we get we often get asked, you know, how, I want to start a nonprofit as well. I want to create some social impact for the, the for profit that I that I have, and I want to be able to help my community in this, that, or the other. So we have a lot of questions about how to set up a nonprofit. We have individual workshops, and then we're excited to be part of the Lead by Rising Tide program, which is funded by the Central Pacific Bank Foundation and the AO Foundation. And that provides women entrepreneurship training for uh, women-owned small businesses making between $250,000 and $5 million a year. And really provides uh, financial management support and an excellent marketing um, program as well. So really excited. We just actually started our program last night. And then we have Shop Small Hawaii, which is a community-facing program. And that's to help all small businesses in Hawaii and to um, twofold. It's to create consumer awareness for shopping small and shopping local in our community. And then also for the small businesses, uh, we provide free online promotion through our Instagram and Facebook for them. So it's, it's a nice way to uh, promote our small business community. Uh,
which is a one-week program, um, either at spring break or over the summer, and it's focused on middle school girls. So we really believe that building confidence for women, which is going back to my leadership program, is the number one reason why women come to our Center for Leadership Help. If you just kind of pull, have everybody just talk, why are they here, what are your issues, what's happening, it's, as Millie said, it's leadership and making that connection and building that support network for each other. So in order to increase women's confidence across the board, we really need to start touching them at a much earlier age. And so for us, we've realized, and pretty much there's a lot of research about it too, that middle school so, can be just so jarring and so hard for um, 9 to 12 year old girls that um, we really wanted to create a program that we could help them. So that's our Girl Summit Youth, and it's also our community project for our women's leadership programs. And that's basically it. So um, just to kind of wrap it up about all of our services and things, our, our women's um, entrepreneur and small business programs are focused on building that uh, strengthening and the capability of being able to run your business efficiently, effectively, and um, also being able to keep them from making serious financial mistakes. And then our leadership is focused on the women's leadership capacity and really providing them with that network of support and access to women leaders in the community who want to be there to help them. That's it.
where could we find a places that would represent the brilliance of just regular working class people that have that have great ideas, that have energy, that have um, desire, passion, and motivation to to to, to problem solve around some of the things that are, are you know are all kind of crippling us here in society today. Um, and so we, we set out and um, and we did this um, very quickly. We launched in 2017, and in our first two years, we posted just a million under uh, just under a million in revenue in our first two years of operation. Um, uh, because of, of our cash position, we were able to bring on 20 employees, and, uh, making up staff, roughly 16 staff members, and four interns. And then in, in 2019, right before. <laughs> The shutdown, we recognized as, as Hawaii's best co working space by Hawaii's magazine and some other outlets. Um, and so we were, we were super positive and, and feeling the momentum and feeling like we had, we had the right ingredients of this, this, this new ideal space where we could bring our local values, we could bring our Hawaii values um, to a place where people could show up as their most authentic selves and then network with others and find collaborative solutions to tackle things like affordable housing, uh, regenerative tourism, sustainable agriculture. Um, this all came to a halt. Um, and, and in March 2020, when we shut down, um, we saw our revenue plummet to 75, we lost 75% of our revenue as a membership co-working space and space rent, space rental. That's our primary um, economic financial activities. Membership co-working space and space rental. So that all basically went away. Um, we had we had three employees. Um, unfortunately we had to let go of many of our employees and, and only had three. Here's the, 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 the hopeful part of this story. Um, we had to pivot like every other small business. And here's the part that I really want to convey to all of you, is that it was women entrepreneurs. It was women business owners. It was women caterers, like Auntie Tammy Smith, like um, like Maire at Unu Kalo Bakery, um, and Olena Cafe. These women-owned businesses, small businesses, we were all suffering together, but we found creative ways to leverage the, the little dollars that we had at this point, and what we could give was our time and effort to lend there. So, for example, I did not not had um, you know cash to, to execute on X, Y, and Z activities, but what I did have was a pretty good social media presence, and I could lend that um, social media presence to my friends, and they were then able to return and reciprocate um, back to me with, with photography, for example or with, um, with event planning. So we, we stumbled upon a way for which we can transact together in a much more generative way. Um, so that's, that's one of the key lessons. Um, you know, and I gotta tell you, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm here today, I'm stoked to be here, but I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little low energy, and, and here's the, the reason why. Um, I'm just going to be real straight up with you. It's, it's hard. It's hard to be an entrepreneur and a mom. I'm a mom of two. So my, do my daughter's uh, first day of kindergarten today. Um, and and um, I want to also share with you that burnout is real. You know, in my 25 years of being um, in, in the workforce, I've had two burnouts. After 10 years at a, you know, as a founding executive director at a nonprofit, and then my second burnout was after I led uh, two different charter schools as a school principal. And so it's really real. But here's what I'm, I'm, I'm learning um, is that I actually am taking a lot of the lessons or a lot of the insights that our keynote speaker said today is that I do believe that we need to make sure that we hold a little bit of energy for ourselves. I'm just going to speak out loud for myself. I am realizing I get too much sometimes 
Um, because we have the responsibilities of family, of our civic community, of our businesses. I'm sure many of you sit on nonprofit boards and all the community things. I'm sure we all do that because it's, it's necessary. At the same time, I don't. Um, I know that I don't make enough time for myself to regenerate and to recover. So, friends, associates, colleagues, peers, um, let's do that. Let's find new ways. Um, for which we can we can we can get to task at the things that are, are most important to us. But let's also be brave enough to say, I have I have some boundaries and I need to take care of my my personal health and well-being so that I can show up again for you as my most powerful, beautiful, authentic self and give you everything I can at that time. And just to close. Um, what I envision for the future. So by the collective, we have two spaces. Uh, one in the one, one in the one EV. We are going to be, what's, what's ahead for us is that we're um, going to be opening up our third in Ko'olau, uh, in Ko'olau, on Oahu, and then a fourth in, on Hawaii Island. So we're very excited about that. And um, I am looking to partner with others um, so I can, I really want to work on a franchise model, and I want to support women women, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Asian American women to own and operate their own Kauai spaces wherever community, culture, and commerce believes that they need a generative wellspring um, for co-creative uh, collaboration making work. And so with that, my final comments is these here are these like questions for ourselves. If we have these spaces, perhaps we can we could respond to we are the women technologists that will partner with women hydrologists to bring forth solutions to clean up Red Hill? We are the women developers um, that will collaborate with women community builders like Auntie Twinkle, the Pool Noah of White Eye, to create model communities grounded in indigenous innovations like Ahupua and Kaupali systems? And we are the Wahine hotel industry leaders and policy makers that, were, that will revolutionize tourism from one that is extracted to one that is generated. So with that, we have our we have our, our charge. We're all part of the collaborative solution making. Maternity leave for women almost doesn't exist in Japan. 
Once they get pregnant, they have no choice but give up on their careers. Um, more than 50% of women who gave up birth, they wouldn't be able to come back to work. Discrimination and cultural prejudice for women still exist in Japanese society. Many people think women should stay home, do housework, and look after kids. After my son was born, I also couldn't continue working at IBM Japan for a long time. That's why I created this company to empower women. My ideas to solve these issues are to provide flexible job opportunities and environments that they can utilize their abilities. Since last year, we have been developing the project while receiving the adoption of multiple accelerator programs. We started joint development with a large company matched by this accelerator program. We are building a consistent platform for females to connect, learn together by providing training programs and have the opportunities to be an entrepreneur or to get back to the workplace by watching with clients. Two reasons why housewives are unable to work are distractions on where and when they can work. Distractions on working places are being eliminated by the increase in telework jobs due to the pandemic. Therefore now, the biggest reason Japanese housewives cannot work is the time limit. For example, many moms can only work two hours a day due to childcare and so on. Therefore, we are currently conducting the trial of a matching service in which about three women are teaming up to undertake project type work from clients. Female members' strengths and experiences are different and can be combined. So another advantage is that clients can have them perform the work of three roles with the same budget as one person. Rather than providing entry level and skilled <coughs> labor, we plan to, plan to provide rewarding jobs that make use of their abilities and experience. They can be motivated because of rewarding jobs and paid work. We also aim to bring about regional development. In training programs, we mainly help female members to recover their self-confidence through coaching sessions, community activities, as well as interaction among them. We hope, eventually, women in Japan get treated equally as men and live their own life as they should. If we succeed in closing the gender gap in Japan, we would like to develop this system to help women suffering from inequality in other countries. Thank you very much. So, we are four of our panelists which are done. So, just really, I'm going to share my story. Just, just so meet all. So, actually, my name is, uh, is Jessie Kim, and my original name is Jong Hyun Kim. Um, I was born in North Korea and raised in North Korea, and I resettled in North Korea in 2014, and I'm Coach to high school and middle school and university in South Korea. And then now, uh, someone who read my bio here, in my message, just a part of my bio, I also founded this kitchen in, in South Korea in 2020 with, during the COVID. <laughs> yeah, so it was a good time for me. So uh, actually, my company wanted to tell you about North Korean people's story, but only it doesn't only not North Korean people's story. Uh, we wanna share about the uh, understood how North Korean people live in North Korea. It doesn't uh, the it doesn't like the government. So only focus on North Korean people.
before. So I am sharing the, my story and draw the food. So I am making some uh, from North Korean recipe and making some food, uh, teaching to people how North Korean food to like, how cooking North Korean food to like. And we are like something South Korean and North Korean is our same, we have same culture and we are Korean Peninsula, I like something, same people, we are also speaking same language, but we uh, stop like how? <laughs> Divorce like things and divide for 70 more years. So exactly lots of uh, culture and like something speaking uh, accent are exactly different. So lots of North Korean defectors, even the young child, they came to South Korea. Uh, most of people like struggling. They have a lot of something uh, criminalism. Like <laughs> South Korean looks like the people and they think. So I am cheered, cheered up and hey, Jesse do this kind of business. Jesse can do it. We can do whatever we want. And I'm always talking to uh, my friend. You first do it. Nobody, if you don't do anything else, nobody helps you. Nobody knows <laughs> what kind of problem you have, what kind of you need it, nobody knows. So just go to speak and anything else you can do it first and then people can recognize you, can help you, can they know uh, what kind of problem we have. So that's why I have the best chance to come to uh, join the East to West Center this changing basis women's relationship seminar one of South Korean like it's not recognized as a present about South Koreans, so uh, that's why I can hear me all of you and uh, listen to this of the amazing panelist story. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
So that's something we continue to struggle with, um, which is why leadership and bringing in CEOs and having that perspective sharing is really important in our program, is being able to be amongst others and kind of feeling that um, ability to go big, think big, and that you can do that from there. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Before Pia does it. The question wasn't to me. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> and you and um, I have a question just kind of following through on that. And what Mahina and Colleen, uh, we need to reach out to kids. And I know you have a program, but they have to come to you. Mm -hmm. How are we reaching out to, to young girls? Right. And, and establishing their confidence so that they do think that they can do whatever they want to. Great. Well, so far, uh, youth programs we reach out to the uh, to the schools. So that's the that's the probably the most uh, girls we can reach, and the easiest way for us to get there, right? So it's connection again, like I really said. Luckily, last year in our leadership cohort, we had a DOE participant, and so she helped tremendously. So we had our largest group of girls for our youth program because it's a week or one week program eight to five for five days in a row. It's a huge lift for my team. And so with the Leadership Alliance support, with having five women per day, different women per day, helping to support the, the girls, enabled us to have 30 versus 10 for the week. So it really, 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 even though it doesn't seem like a lot, that was a huge expansion for us at that point. But, um, do you provide transportation or do they? That's the one. That's the one piece is the transportation, especially here, right? So to try to get a school bus here is almost impossible outside of you know going to um, public school. And then the other thing is liability, frankly, because I would if I want to start my program at eight, then I have to have a team member meeting in Kapolei or Waianae to at 5.30 in the morning to help girls get on a bus, and the second they get on a bus, we're responsible for them. And then they aren't going to get home until 7 or 8 at night, right? So I just don't have that infrastructure to help support that huge elite in program size. Yeah, I can build a little bit and share it. So, um, yeah, just drawing from my previous experience in the education system, so we have a huge competitive advantage in Hawaii, being that our Department of Education, we have a single unified state system. So theoretically, once a policy is, is, is made at the Board of Education, it should have a big and almost immediate trickle-down effect. So, I mean, we need to look at who the Board of I, I lost track of who are the current Board of Education um, members and track them and get them to advocate and what is the living position of Patsy um, Center and other women-led organizations to support young uh, women entrepreneurship classes free and accessible to all, all girls in our public school system. We also have an incredibly well-organized Hawaii Association of Independent Schools in Hawaii. And if they wanted to do so, they, they, they could make that happen. And I, I, would, I would say, in my mind, they have enough political prominence and economic prominence to you know, create a, a program and a pipeline that's going to first benefit their students within the place of their schools, but have a spillover effect on public school students as well. Second, issue, here's the issue side, like an opportunity, um, Wi-Fi. Broadband access, equitable broadband, broadband access, is a problem, and it should not be. But it's like it could be a great equalizer, right? So if all, imagine this: if all, if we make sure that all girls had access, broadband access, and, and, a, and a digital device, and um, partner, you know, to, to provide financial literacy and other courses. I think that I think that's something doable, but the right people got to come together around the table, and we have to exercise our voices to make that a, a, an important issue. I can add to that actually. So Mahina and I are actually on the advisory board for an organization called Rise High, and so what it does is actually, you know, when you think about children. Your world is only the world you've had experience with, right? So if your mom was a school teacher, your dad was a fireman, those are kind of like the two options you're seeing as 
your your what you could be, what you could potentially be. So uh, uh, Rise High actually helps to create more of that storytelling of kids that actually did grow up here, went to high school here, and what they've done with their lives that is totally different than traditional industry. Um, and really working hard with you know the DOE and the charter schools to get that into the actual classroom, because that's part of the challenge. So unless you have a personal connection, they're not just going to say, oh, here's our list of all our students. Just email them and let them know about this program. <laughs> and it's like, that's obviously not happening. So, um, and I was just talking to someone today about how I'd love to be in more of the schools. One, we couldn't do that because of COVID. And two, you know, we're all running our own organizations and businesses, so we can't spend you know half a day at Campbell and the other half at Harrington and like do that for half a week. Um, while still running our businesses. So it's actually, Zoom's been wonderful, but also organizations like High, uh, Rise High, where it's a video, a really short kind of attention span theater with like animation and kind of sizzle, like, but, but how long is it? Each video, like three minutes or less, less than that? Because you know, kids have 18 and short attention. So anyway, so um, it's been wonderful to just start to broaden these kids, and, but, but I think the next challenge is not only do they get that awareness of like other careers and local people that look just like them, they're doing them here, but then what does that continuum look like where they can then sign up for your program? Like how do we actually create that next step once they get inspired? So. Anyone there? Um, I would like to <laughs> explain something that um, I've I've noticed as an entrepreneur lately, especially as a woman entrepreneur, I would like you all to uh, talk about how important relationships are, um, even if you don't have an immediate um, partnership in mind for a person or anything like that. But just speak on how relationships are so important and how, how far back are they really going for you at this point in your career. Like 
My girlfriend that I've known since elementary school let me borrow her boardroom. That was like the extent of what I, I would ask. You know, it wasn't some huge thing. She's like, yeah, take it, take it to the day. And it was just all the little pieces that are always ends up being like this next little hurdle you have to get over, which tends to come in in, in weird ways to, um, with help from your network. Um, to uh, relations to build the relationship is um, official space and main dominance, so it's very hard to get into the woman because uh, women are usually uh, seen like uh, are you a supportive person, but uh, we try to uh, show the experiences on the website or a PR that the woman has a um, experience and achievement um, for, uh, for women entrepreneurs to uh, we build some website to uh, visualize the, how women entrepreneurs or leaders are very <coughs> person there. And we also try to um, connect the government person and uh, uh, big company person because I have been in my name Japan so I have the connection so I utilize the connection and uh, 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 governmental connection to share the next generation's women then we now uh, have some official uh, meeting place and uh, meeting opportunities to uh, with various background like a government, big companies, small companies. So we, uh, we now start that organization right now. So now women also can connect to many relationships. So, so we try to build such opportunities. <coughs>